Now imagine that there's a set of qualities that makes it more probable that you'll get to the top of a dominance hierarchy. Now, that's not that hard to imagine, right? You might think, well, intelligence might have something to do with that. Attractiveness might have something to do with that. Power. We know from studies of chimps, and this is mostly done by Franz de Waal, that, you know, because you might think of a kind of prototypical caveman society, that it's like the, the caveman that looks most like a bodybuilder who's the most dominant caveman, but, so to speak. But what de Waal found among the chimps was that the chimp who was at the top of the male dominance hierarchy, who remained at the top relatively stably, so that he wasn't brutally murdered, say, by two chimps that were below him in the dominance hierarchy, was actually kind of a good leader in some sense, you know. So he got along well with the females in the troop, and maybe even attended to their children to some degree, and he wasn't a completely unpredictable tyrant. And if he was like that, then, you know, a couple of male chimps would form a coalition, and when his back was turned at any moment, then they'd rip him to pieces. And so, so that's really, it's phenomenally interesting, because what it suggests is that there's a stable set of characteristics, relatively stable, that are operative within a dominance hierarchy that propels you to the top. And that, and that that's characteristic not only of human dominance hierarchies, but it's also characteristic in a way that's analogous to even chimp dominance hierarchies. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting idea, right? There's a set of stable traits that propels you towards the top. And some of those would be indicators of biological health, like symmetry and beauty. And some of them would be, well, what other characteristics the rest of the bloody troop think are admirable? And because admirable is also a very interesting phenomenon, right? Because there are people you admire. You think, well, why are there people that, that you admire? And what does it mean to admire someone? And what it means in some sense is that the effect they have on you is one of wanting to imitate. And you know, human beings, a lot of our knowledge, a tremendous amount of our knowledge, isn't propagated linguistically, it's propagated through imitation. And the probability that we were imitating each other before we developed language is extremely high. And we're also one of the few animals, maybe the only animal, that are really capable of true imitation. And it's a major league advance in terms of the transformation of information because what it means is you can go out there and half kill yourself learning how to do something and stumble back into the tribe and recover and then I can just watch you and embody what you did and poof, I've got the damn information and you know, I didn't have to expose myself to dragons and, and all sorts of other horrible things that were out there in the unknown. And so, you know, we're imitating ourselves all the time. So if you admire someone what that does is hook up, it hooks into your desire to imitate. And that's also part of an, like an in, inbuilt, intrinsic biological process. Okay, now, fine, so here's what we're going to say. Dominance hierarchy. Reason for getting to the top. That produces admiration. Partly because people want to be at the top of a dominance hierarchy. That's success. And we're, we're wired to climb dominance hierarchies. Because the top of a dom if you live at the top of a dominance hierarchy, you live longer than you do if you live at the bottom of a dominance hierarchy. Even if you factor out the effect of relative income. It's, more, it's less stressful at the top. You have better resources at the top. And the top is a place. Right? Because it's, it's been around for 400 million years. It's a place. It's like a conceptual place in a sense. Or it's a, a place that's the emergent property of social organization. But it's a place. And it's a place where people want to go. Okay. You got a dominance hierarchy. Someone gets to the top, you admire them. All right. But that's not exactly what human beings are like. First of all, there isn't one dominance hierarchy. There's hundreds of the bloody things, especially as society becomes complex. There's a, a, a radically variegated realm of dominance hierarchies, right? And so, then you might ask yourself, across the set of dominance hierarchies, is there a set of properties that makes people likely to get to the top? And that's the kind of question that only a creature capable of abstraction could ask or posit. And I would say that the figure that represents the properties that produces the highest probability of climbing to the top of the set of all dominance hierarchies is a messianic figure. That's what a messianic figure is. So, and it's a kind of abstraction, it says, because of course, obviously a messianic figure is an ideal, right? Clearly. 
And so then you might think, well, an ideal in relationship to what? Well, the, he, he, generally, is the perfect person. Well, how would we come up with the concept of what constitutes perfect? Think about it as a biological category. Well, there's hardly anything more perfect than the ability to climb to the top of whatever dominance hierarchy you happen to be put in. Now, one of the things I would say is that women exerted tremendous selection pressure on men to be exactly that sort of creature. So, and I can tell you a little bit of experimental evidence that we have in relationship to that later. Unfortunately, it was an unpublished study because it was an undergraduate thesis, but... But what the hell else would women select men for? If they had any sense. You know, you want to select a partner. Because, you know, you've heard the idea of hypergamy, right? Women mate across or up dominance hierarchies. But there seems to be an employment issue, too. And, I mean, that's a complicated problem because, you know, the... the Employment market for people who are less skilled has has been I would say in decline especially on the male end of the distribution and one of the stats that Farrell cites is that um, Three quarters of women will not Consider seriously dating an unemployed man whereas one-third of men would have a problem Dating an unemployed woman, so there's obviously a gender bias there, and I think there's a reason for that I, sure. I think that it's grounded in it's grounded in both rationality and evolutionary biology, the evolutionary biology element is that women across cultures tend to mate across and up hierarchies, let's say. That's right. And the, the reason for that, I think, is that they're logically, and this is where the logic comes in as well as the biology, they're looking for a partner that can be of substantial economic utility, practical utility, when they put themselves in the vulnerable position of having a child. Mm -hmm. So then you also have this additional problem is if the employment situation tanks in any serious way, then men become less desirable as partners. And your claim, I guess, in part is that by filling that void, the government actually contributes to the problem rather than, than addressing it. You know, you could be really, really, really excited and really, really, really nervous, which might happen, for example, if you were going to a job interview and you actually wanted the job. It would be even worse if you went to a job interview and like 30% of you wanted the job because, you know, that's the 30% that wants to develop and another 30% would just soon fail so that you crawl under your bed at home and stay there with the dust bunnies till you're 40 and, you know, another 25% of you is resentful about the fact that you have to go get a stupid job at all and so then you go in there and it's really, really complicated because not only is the, all that potential there, but you're fractured and those fractures make the whole situation way more complicated and unstable than it would otherwise have to be. So, and that happens to people all the time, you know, I mean, people hedge their bets in job interviews all the time because they think, eh, I don't really care. It's like, no, you care. You just want to have a story to tell yourself if you fail. Well, and then if you have that story, well, then probably you're going to fail because you don't get to do that. You can't go in there at 60% and hope to win. You have to go in there at 100%. Now, that's cool, too, because what it implies is just what the clinical psychologists have been telling people for 60 years or 70 years, right? You have to voluntarily face the things that you're afraid of. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, because otherwise you could just go play in traffic. You know, so it's, it's not a call to stupid adventure. What it does is assume that you've got a direction, and that the direction is a valid direction. And then that what happens is, as you pursue that, obstacles emerge, anomalous, threatening obstacles. And then you either confront them, or you abandon the whole project. Well, generally speaking, if you chop them into little pieces, then you can confront them and digest them and then you get stronger because you're doing all this digesting it's like you're eating the you're eating the monster of chaos and, and that's a classic metaphor for for developing wisdom to ingest Piaget even uses that right assimilate it's exactly the same idea as ingesting instead of what you're eating is information instead of matter and so you know when the information restructures you it makes you more informed and that puts you more in formation. So, so you know, you, you encounter the anomaly and it's a burst of contradictory potential. And so that's exactly how you respond to it. Your body's going everywhere at once. 
because God only knows what's going to happen. And then as you interact with it, it collapses. You're collapsing it. That's what happens when you take control of the situation. And then you reduce it to a single path where everything's going properly. And you might say, well, you're bending it to your own selfish wills, but that's not right. Because if you're in, let's say you're in an interview and there's five or six people in there, you can't just bend the damn thing to your will because you have to interact with those people. And so if you don't do that with, you know, you could be a psychopath and manipulate, but that'll only work for a short period of time. You'll get caught and then you'll have to move because that's what psychopaths do. But if you're, that's how they keep being psychopaths, you know, they exhaust everyone's trust and then they have to move. And then they go find some other people who are trustworthy because they've built up trust capital with other people and then they, you know, betray them, but they have to keep moving. So it's an unstable solution. So you go in there and you do it properly well, what are you doing exactly? You know, I would say that if you're really, really nailing that interview, you're saying, well, here's a, here's a future that we could all march together into confidently and happily. That's what you're saying. And I'm the person to do that. Now, you might be saying that on a relatively low scale. Like, if I'm your assistant, you're never going to have to worry about me because I'm always going to be there, you know. And then if maybe you're the CEO, you're going to say, well, you know, this is, this is the way that all of us are going and here's why and this is what it's going to look like. And the better you are at that, the more that potential will turn into, it, it multiplies, that's what happens. If you're good at dealing with it, the, the potential that's accessible to you multiplies. So which is really cool and also how you'd hope it would be. Because you know, you'd hope that more potential would manifest itself to people who are more competent. If things worked well, that would be good.